supporters. Um, we have got the 100 year ball coming up, which is the Great Gatsby, and I hope that you will all, all attend. We actually have limited numbers. I think there's 600 we can fit? No, no, no. <laughs> 500? 300? It'll be close to 400. 400, and I understand that bookings are already looking tight. So if you want to come, you want to dress as the Great Gatsby, and you imagine yourself waking up with Leonardo, which I do, but you know, um, then you better book You're really soon. Best. Hey? <laughs> second best. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, Philip. Um, and um, so we've got that. Someday we've got the 100 year sail coming up and I hope that we've got power boats, we've got sail boats, we've got racing boats, we've got cruising boats. And at this stage, Ollie, we've got 18 or 20 boats, wherever Ollie is. 25 boats? Well, let's make it 50 boats. And if you're a power boat, you know what? It's a beautiful day. Go out and follow us around. Come back, have a hamburger. You might win a 100, 100 year um, bottle of wine. I think it's only a bit. I want to say some thank yous to Rochelle because she has been, is she, in, oh, there she is. She has put everything, her heart and soul into the 100 year celebration. And I know how disappointed she was when things didn't pan out quite. But she's really glad that we're still here and we're celebrating. I don't know Catherine, is that Catherine? Hi, I'm Robbie, we have emailed. Um, and that's been fantastic. So I think that's me done. I am going to pass over to Anita, who's going to pass over to Bernie. So thank you all very much for coming tonight and for being part of this magnificent club. Thank you. you that Bernie did an amazing job on putting together a hundred year magazine. It was going to be a, a bit more than a magazine but we didn't get it quite, well we're not going to have enough photos to make it much more but we're hoping it will be something. I have a box of them there, they're ten dollars. The effort that Bernie and Carolyn Jupp put in to making this and um, Josh and um, Carolyn from you know, the, the media people was just amazing and it's a fabulous book and I hope you've all seen it. But if you want one, I've got them for sale tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Robbie, and thank you very much, everyone, for coming and being here tonight. A lot of you, like me, have just come from the um, Declaration of the Winners of the 2020 mm. Photocomp. And Bernie was our judge for that as well as a presenter for tonight, so we like to keep him very busy. Um, tonight's event really is, is about looking at a history of 100 years of Fremantle Sailing Club. And if we just take a moment to think about history, it's often said it's written by the winners. Uh, more than anything, I think it's about the selection of detail and what's important at the time. And what I find really interesting is that over time what is important changes. So a lot of effort goes into trying to hear the silent voices of things left out. Um, in that, I'd like to say my thanks not only to Bernie, but also to the Archives Committee, I think there's a few reps here this evening, um, who find and preserve the details that a presentation like tonight and, and work like the book actually relies on. With our Facebook, our Instagram, Snapchat and, and all the rest, we may actually be with the best documented generation ever. And I do wonder, is the details that we capture at the moment in any way important? Only time will tell, but even in five years' time, there's going to be a picture of who we are today. And of course, with, with the COVID situation, it's going to capture a unique period in time. However, it is my honour to hand over to Bernie Cox to show us at any rate how we got here. Thank you very much. I have to confess that this is my second attempt at getting this right. <laughs> and I should probably fess up and say that the first one finished with the MC for the day, having to physically push me away from the thing to stop me from talking. 
because uh, dinner was ready and uh, way over, over time. So we've revised the uh, program a little and hopefully uh, I'll keep you entertained for the next half hour or so. Firstly, may I say a few little things about me for those of you who haven't come across me before. I've been a member of Fremantle Sailing Club since 1992. I am a photographer, among other things. I'm a nationally accredited air race officer for another 12 months or so before I run out, and I won't be renewing. I was an offshore sailor back in the day, uh, when we didn't have GPS and we used uh, hand-bearing compasses and sextants and stuff. I won the Ron Tuff gold medallion from Yachting WA for lifetime services to the sport. And that's one of the proudest achievements that I've had in the sport of yachting. I'm a current member of the Bali and Exmouth Organising Committee, such as it is, and I stumbled on these uh, centenary celebrations by accident, really. Um, and a little bit of bullying from this lady at the front row. Um, Whoever wrote the flyer for this thing really does have a good, good sense of humour. Uh, accomplished? I think that's the second time I've seen that word. And it's accomplished, really? <laughs> Just an ordinary member who was asked to do a job, and I will do that to the best of my ability, but I am not a gifted public speaker, so please bear with me. And I suppose it's also a good moment to reflect on the fact that, she I mean, you've been here for a bit over 20 years, why would you pick somebody with such a short history within the club to do this particular presentation? Don't know, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, a couple of my favourite photos as a photographer, and Phil and Robbie's uh, Condelli features prominently in, in a number of my favourite photos, um, she's a magnificent ship at the best of times, but this particular shot was taken down at Mandurah when it was blowing about 35, 40 knots, and uh, really shows the power of the beast. The bottom photo of uh, Alan Stein's uh, uh, Dirty Deeds is one of my all-time favourites, and it's not because it's a particularly good photograph of the boat, but have a look at... Have a look at the grin on Alan's face. <laughs> He is in his element and doing what he loves to do and the boat is just uh, responding to all the things that he and his crew got right. And uh, from that point of view, it remains one of my absolute all-time favourites. I'd like to flash back too to prove that what I said a moment ago was actually true. I do know how to use the sextant and in fact I won the Navigator's Prize in the 1981 uh, Bali race. <clears throat> Alright, let's get down to business. Firstly, while many of the photos you'll see tonight are mine, I'd like to also acknowledge the other photographers whose work I've used in this, and they're far too numerous to mention, and all their work was obtained through the club archives, uh, which are controlled by Carolyn Jupp, and she does an amazing job in that, uh, in that office. Australia, as we all know, is an island nation, and Fremantle is its WA port. It's pretty logical, therefore, that we would have an interest in all things maritime. So since 1829, when success dumped its first load of settlers on the, at the Swan River Colony, it's relied on its seafaring folks, and we've thrived with the challenge of the sea ever since. It was a bit of a surprise to me when I was doing the research on this that uh, it took until 1879 before Fremantle became WA's principal port. Up until that time, more freight went into Albany than went into Fremantle. And the turning point, of course, was uh, the building of Fremantle Harbour, which was finished on the 4th of May in 1897, after five years in the building. And even when this photo was taken in 1911, there were still an awful lot of pure sail ships and a lot of ships that relied on a combination of sail and power. Rod Mulcahy gave me a little bit of advice before I started this little gig, he said, look, Bernie, whatever you do, don't say anything controversial. <laughs> so, with Rod's words ringing in my ears, I'm going to step straight into the realm of controversy and uh, get into the controversial part of my talk today. If we play our cards right, 
we could be celebrating a bicentenary and a centenary every few years from now on. Uh, Les Valmadre, when he made that post, was obviously upset when he put it on Facebook, and he has every right on it to his opinion. His grandfather was one of the first people to sponsor competitive sailing in WA, and he ran a pub down in Fremantle. His pub, incidentally, was the main gathering place for sailors back in the day. We still acknowledge, although Les is an active sailor at Royal Perth Yacht Club, we still acknowledge his uh, contribution by running our Winter Valmadre series, as all of you know. Well, was Les right in what he claimed here? Damn right he was. Um, to get a true perspective, let's have a look at what Carolyn Jupp has put together as a proper explanation of where we are today. From this slide, you can see that sailing in Frio began in 1872. So we can argue for a bicentenary celebration in 2072, can't we? The original Fremantle Sailing Club was formed in 1885, that's just before the harbour opened, and it died without a whimper a year later, so maybe we can have another bicentenary celebration in 2085. Fremantle Harbour was opened on the 4th of May 1897, and in 1902 we saw an amalgamation of two little clubs, the North Fremantle Sailing Club, which later became the Fremantle Sailing Club, and the reformed Fremantle Yacht Club to become the West Australian Yacht Club. So, in 2102, folks, we're up for another bicentenary. That enterprise stumbled to a halt, however, in 1908, and with the interference of World War I, nothing transpired on the sailing front until, drum roll please, the formation of the Port Yacht Club in 1920. And that's what we're celebrating this year. Norm Berto, I think, deserves an awful amount of credit for trying to draw attention to the need to preserve our history at a nostalgia night when we handed over the Louisa Street Clubhouse. He, um, he gave a very eloquent uh, uh, address at that uh, thing, which I'll come to a little later in this presentation. But our founders were a pretty tough breed. Uh, back in the day, volunteers dismantled the old field bathing shed, which was down at Bathers Beach, an old timber structure, which was not in terribly pristine condition at the time anyway. Why would it be? That's why they gave it away. And panel by panel, it was uh, deconstructed and then either carried or floated or both all the way down from Bathers Beach to here and was reconstructed roughly where our railway crossing is today and thus that became our first home. The process of rebuilding was pretty painstaking. You can see they used ropes to hold the panels up and then ease them down for uh, transport. And the finished building, which you can see there, sort of set on a mound of sand and served us well for quite a number of years. The guys who built that building were iron men and boys. They had very few tools and uh, that built a, a lasting monument. Many of you might remember the Louisa Street Clubhouse, which was served as the club's base from 1946 <coughs> right through to the building of these premises in the 1970s. For £109, the then Commodore Joe Cooper uh, joined forces with uh, Les Cook to buy two blocks of land on the corner of Marine Terrace and uh, Louisa Street which they then uh, made available to the club as a clubhouse. That was in 1939. And World War II, of course, uh, intervened there. So um, everything stopped. And in, uh, in 1942, the army had had enough of this dilapidated building sitting on where the railway crossing is at the moment, and promptly demolished it and was never to be seen again. In 1946, though, the club got together and purchased, and I don't have a purchase price for you, but I'm told it was purchased, maybe it was a gift, from the US Army, uh, an army drill hall. And like the original clubhouse before it, it was stripped and broken down into pieces and reassembled at Louisa Street to form our Louisa Street clubhouse. In 1960 though, 
the state government decided that it was time to build the Fremantle Fisherman's Harbour. And if you know where Louisa Street, you know where the Fisherman's Harbour is, you can see that effectively we were chopped off from our principal access to the water. So for quite a number of years, the club languished as little more than a uh, social club. And uh, the weekly dances there, I'm told by my wife, were very, very popular. At the Nostalgia Night, presented by the Social Committee on the 15th of June 1984, uh, that was the event I'm I was talking about where Norm Berto made an impassioned address to, uh, to members, uh, pleading for anybody who had archival material uh, to please to present it to the club. And that was really the forerunner to an archive section in the club, which has been very uh, capably managed in recent years by Carolyn Judd. And I, if I keep uh, ringing Carolyn's praises, please forgive me, but she does such an amazing job for this club that uh, if you want to know something about what happened here or who won what back when, she will find it for you. In 1901, according to uh, the address, uh, a letter from the Fremantle Sailing Club Honorary Secretary was written to C.Y. O'Connor, nonetheless, asking him to become the Vice Patron of the club for the 1901 season. Uh, but World War I, of course, intervened and um, put a halt to sailing altogether. The club blazers have changed a little in the time. The days prior to um, computerised badge making. Uh, but I'd like to go firstly to another timeline to try and put subsequent events into some sort of perspective. In 1971, the Perth Chamber of Commerce started thinking about the fact that we had a sesquicentenary coming up for the state of Western Australia. That's 150 years. In 1974, the state government wasn't satisfied that the chamber was proceeding with things in an orderly sort of a way. They didn't seem to be making an awful lot of headway, so the state government committed to taking the project on instead. And their argument was based on some very interesting parameters. Uh, they first they, they figured that it was necessary as part of the celebrations to have an, an ocean event recognise our maritime heritage uh, and we couldn't do that without a significant oceanfront marina. Oh, oh, got an idea for you. So the argument was based on the current dangerous congestion on the Swan River. Let me take you back to that time. It's easy to forget that back in the 19, late 1970s right through the 1980s, Royal Perth Yacht Club would field a fleet of 120 keelboats every Saturday afternoon. South of Perth had similar numbers and Royal Freshwater Bay had similar numbers. So you can see there were between three and four hundred yachts ranging from sort of 20 feet up to 50, 50, 55, um, all struggling for space in the Swan River and yes there were a few bingles and uh, but we coped. But their primary argument behind the need for a coastal marina was the dangerous congestion on the Swan River. And that's a quote. There was a much needed facility for an oceanfront uh, marina to cater for international yachts visiting WA. Any visiting yacht here had nowhere to go. A new venue to rejuvenate the Fremantle Sailing Club. Well, who could, uh, who could not agree with that, looking at the Louisa Street premises that, uh, that were at that time? and having a credible venue for the finish of the planned Palmelia race. And I'll talk a bit more about the Palmelia race in a while. So on the 3rd of March in 1978, the WA government offered Fremantle Sailing Club this current site for the development of a clubhouse and a marina. In October 78, the ground preparation began for its development. And on the 22nd of October 1978, we had our first opening day on the grounds and of course they were a long, long way from complete. We have an artist's impression of what the clubhouse might look like before the plans were finalised. And uh, I think you can see from there that we sat pretty close to the uh, original 
ideas. <clears throat> I have a couple of images here of the club under construction. And then Sir Charles Court, who planted a tree, and on the right hand side, number two tree, which he also planted, but I don't have a photo of the, the, uh, the second planting. In 1979, in November, we hosted the first major yachting event at this club in the Palmelia race. <clears throat> we had an opening day, but the project was far from complete. The uh, Royal Perth Yacht Club Annex was still to be built at this time that we opened. So you can see the, uh, we, we were still bordering directly onto the uh, Cape Delando Drive and the Fisherman's <coughs> Harbour in those days. And I'm sure, speed up, keep up, keep up, thank you. Uh, I'm sure most of you will have seen the plaque downstairs which officially opened the, uh, the clubhouse that we now enjoy. The bubble burst um, immediately afterwards. The euphoria of the new clubhouse, the new marina, all these major events happening, and an interest rate that went from about 5% when things were first planned up to 11%. 13% and finished up at 18% and of course the club was incapable of handling the loans that it was committed to. Um, so it was a catastrophic situation for the club um, and it was laid bare at an annual general meeting. The consensus was that the club must wipe out the Commonwealth Trading Bank loan and the Taylor Woodrow debt, the Taylor Woodrow being the company that built the place. Um, and any commercial outstanding debts. Those the the principal idea at the meeting at that point was to wipe all those major items out altogether. The committee then meant to meant to uh, present an all uh, heap of alternatives to a meeting of general meeting of members, and Don Kyle put forward a three pronged plan. Plan number one, which was considered by Don himself to be unrealistic, but he put it forward as an option. The idea behind this king hit was to raise $4 million from a membership of approximately 1,200. So in round figures, 1,000 members, 4,000 bucks a pop. Now only 574 of those members were actually pen holders, so the remainder of them would get no real value from their $4,000 investment. So According to Don's uh, projections, uh, he speculated that if the, the membership losses went as high as 50%, all of a sudden you're left with an untenable situation where 500 members have got to kick in $8,000 each, and that obviously wasn't going to happen back in, in the 1970s, 70s, 80s, 80s. <clears throat> so the middle road solution was based on members' preferences at previous meetings, trying to spread the load over 1,200 members including 80% of the pen lessees and hard stand occupiers. That aimed to raise $2.5 million in round figures. It would eliminate all of the debt apart from an SGIO loan, SGIO loan but the Commonwealth Trading Bank loan and the Taylor Woodrow debt would be wiped under that, uh, uh, under that plan and Don believed that to be our best possible chance of success. The third option didn't really meet any of the criteria and didn't really re get any serious treatment in the uh, presentation either. It, uh, it cleared the Commonwealth Trading Bank loan but very little else and it was equitable insofar, only insofar as every member was asked to contribute something. Those were the three options put forward by Don but a, a second option was put together by uh, uh, the Finance Committee which was conditional on reaching a minimum of $1.45 million or all funds would be repaid. There were very strict conditions attached to it as well. Any member deciding to leave the club as a result of, of the fundraising effort uh, would not be eligible to rejoin within two years. The sequence of uh, member repayments would be by ballot. So it was pretty carefully thought through and as a result of that there were a number of uh, uh, unsecured notes issued 
here's a typical one. This particular one was uh, issued to uh, Jeff Carlyle uh, to raise funds to try and get the situation under control. The catalyst for resolving our financial crisis, though, arrived in 1983 when Bondi won the America's Cup. The significance of that victory can't be underestimated as far as this club's uh, future was concerned. All of a sudden, interest in all things sailing became fashionable in Perth and particularly in Fremantle. I'd like to move on to some of the events that shaped the club and I'll go back now to the Palmelia race that changed Fremantle Sailing Club forever, even though the event was run by Royal Perth. What does, what, what does the Palmelia race have to do with Fremantle Sailing, Club, Sailing Club's history? Well, it was conceived as the centrepiece of the uh, 150th uh, anniversary celebrations, along with a massive New Year's Eve concert on the Esplanade, a royal visit by uh, Prince Charles, and I'm sure you all remember uh, Jane Priest's kiss on the Cottesloe Beach, which made all the papers worldwide. So good publicity. A Miss Universe pageant won by Maritza Sayalero from Venezuela. And I'm sure you don't remember that, but you might remember the fact that the paparazzi all gathered around on the catwalk, which probably collapsed, and the photographers and the models all collapsed in the dirty great heap on uh, the foreshore at Perth. Uh, the opening of the Avondale Agricultural Research Station Museum and the, an international conference on the Indian Ocean Studies. So there were a lot of very major events planned by the state government as part of those celebrations and we were the key to it. There were a lot of international entries to join. The, uh, the race was a 10,500 nautical mile journey from Plymouth to Cape Town in South Africa and then finishing back here in Fremantle. 50 entries were received but of those 27 actually fronted. They were split into two divisions, 10 IRR yachts, uh, ranging from 43 feet up to the 83 foot to Anaconda, which was sailed by the armed forces. And in the open division, we had 18 starters ranging from 33 feet and up. So it was a darn good fleet for a long distance international fleet. Raleigh Tasker's Siska 4 was the first yacht to use the new straddle lift at Fremantle Sailing Club in readiness for the Palmelia race. And I won't go into all the details, but we really got the best possible publicity early because Bill Lowe's Panasonic ran into some flotsam and uh, smashed his rudder to pieces and Way 79 hit something uh, within hours and also had to withdraw with hull damage. So immediately there is things happening of, of, uh, of, of involving some drama which in, in, instantly grabs the media attention. So it's not just now a state event, it is an event that's drawing major publicity in Britain in particular and to a lesser extent in Europe. At the other end of the race, when they finally reached here, there was further drama, and the, uh, most of you will probably remember that uh, an Intra 2 ran aground on a reef on the south side of Rockness. Uh, her navigator, Jay Laurie, won't come clean on it even now, I don't think. Uh, but I don't believe it was, it was anything that Jay did or didn't do that caused the boat to run aground. But it was also memorable in other ways too. Uh, Max Sheen's Bluebell won the overall trophy and Independent Endeavour was the first yacht to cross the line after a mammoth battle with uh, Siska after they elected to sail completely different courses. Siska went deep down south, banking on a strong southwesterly to rattle him home, um, whereas uh, Independent Endeavour decided on a more westerly course, got the breeze and uh, finished a couple of hours ahead. Uh, it had drama from every possible respect. The government provided an escort vessel, the HMAS Moresby, which followed the race around the entire journey. And uh, the Palmelia experience was actually the, the event that emboldened this club to tackle its first long distance ocean race in its own right with the Cliffman X Fremantle of the Bali race in 1981. The race attracted huge media attention, not just in Australia, but also in Britain. back in the day when we actually had newspapers that actually had reporters. Uh, on the 2nd of May 1981, the club embarked on its most ambitious race to date. The international got race over 1,440 nautical miles, 
from Fremantle to Bali and back again in the pursuit race over three stages, run while the Parmelia race and all its drama was still fresh in our minds. This, of course, was back in the day where we had two WA newspapers, the West and the Daily News, as well as two Sunday papers, the Sunday Times and the Sunday Independent, and all of them were actually clamouring for stuff to do with the Bali race. Um, if any of you are interested in, in having a look at some of the material that was published at that time, Carolyn would be delighted to show it to you. Uh, there are a couple of uh, funny things that uh, are probably worth reporting from that race. Uh, we had five or so days straight for the fleet that wasn't up with Siska at the head, where they got absolutely hammered with northeasterly winds. And I was so hammered, they were 45 to 50 knots, 24 hours a day, for four or five days straight. And on the last day, just, just before it eased, we had the, the usual weather forecast before the position report. And the forecast came through. The Bureau report is for northerly winds at 20 knots. Uh, when they finished the report, an anonymous radio operator came through on uh, HF and said, These guys have a look out of their bloody windows! <laughs> <laughs> You'll also remember that uh, we didn't have any GPS in 1981. A couple of the well-heeled boats had uh, uh, sat-navs, which were brand spanking new and terribly, terribly expensive, and updated three, four, five times a day to give you a position that was within a hundred or so metres of where you really were. So it was pretty good stuff, bearing in mind that with our sextants, we were lucky to get within a mile of where we were. Um, that, it's interesting, isn't it, that that's only less than 40 years ago, and today we can produce a little handheld thing the size of your mobile phone that will give you your precise location, updated every couple of seconds, and give it to you in three decimal places, so you're within three metres of, of where you really are. So, the, uh, the ramifications of having to uh, use traditional methods were pretty predictable. We had two yachts that finished up on Java, one finished up on the western side of uh, Bali instead of uh, Banoa side, and one finished up on Lombok. But eventually they all got to Banoa, we all had a very good time, and the tourism people in Bali, it was their first uh, time that they'd actually been able to host a fleet, and they were spectacular. They, they made sure that they presented Bali in the best possible way. They put on cultural events and uh, a magnificent uh, presentation evening. In the midst of the financial mayhem, uh, moving back again a, a little, uh, we hosted a very successful sailing world championship. And uh, the uh, invitation there was uh, Jeff Carlyle's invitation to the opening dinner. It was the first international class championship that we ran of any significance. And those of you who knew Solings back, back then, they were an Olympic class, they were very, very popular. All of the world's top sailors had to sail Solings in that world championship in order to retain their credibility. Uh, so anybody who was anybody in the sailing world was there, and Fremantle Sailing Club did a fantastic job in running it. So it was a, a, a very good introduction to our ability at this club to run major events and what a fabulous uh, venue it is for, uh, for such events. Our financial woes were put to one side in preparations for the Cup defence. The government realised the importance of this project and gave us the security we needed to move on and the short facilities required by the America's Cup challenges uh, led to some major changes at Fremantle Sailing Club at the same time the development of the Royal Perth Annex. With a government guarantee and some innovative accounting and fundraising measures that I talked about a minute ago, the club regained its financial stability in remarkably quick time and moved on. We hosted the base camps for French Kiss, for Crusader, Eagle and San Francisco Challenger Syndicates. And the defence may have been unsuccessful, but the legacy it left behind was priceless, wasn't it? We had a major revamp of the Fremantle uh, CBD and like the rest of Fremantle the sailing club flourished with a new enthusiasm. Huge crowds flocked to Fremantle and I was a bit shocked because I, I, I was actually there but I don't remember this sort of stuff happening. 
they're stacked on top of the roofs of the, uh, the cafes and the fishermen's harbour. Just amazing how much uh, support there was for it. We went straight from there um, onto the uh, uh, Whitbread stopover. Again, a major international event, and the facilities that we were able to offer the Whitbread organisation uh, led us to be considered seriously as a stopover uh, port. Uh, it was a major event by any uh, any standards. That in turn, well, the things that attracted them were uh, A, our harbour, and B, the beautiful facilities we had at that time, which, uh, and um, we're going back to the early 1980s, very few people were able to, to match those. <clears throat> we moved them to Sir Robin Knox Johnson and his uh, Clipper Race. Um, WA is one of their favourite stopovers because it, it ends a long transocean voyage from Africa. So, Sir Robin has always preferred to bring the fleet into Fremantle. Unfortunately, we've also had to deal with the political situation in WA, which you might remember uh, had a very strong royalties for regions bias. And so, the West Australian attraction for the Clipper was to have a boat sponsored by Western Australia. So, the government sponsorship for the West Australian boat I think gives the government a certain amount of leverage, and we saw a stopover hosted by Geraldton. We saw another one hosted by uh, Albany, and the last couple have been back here in Fremantle. And I have to tell you from personal experience talking to Sir Robin that they love Fremantle Sailing Club to bits. We give them excellent facilities here um, for their boats, and we give them uh, some really special treatment as people too. The Clipper race with its traditional sail passed in the harbour on their uh, prior to the start of the next leg is part and parcel of what we what we expect from them. And for those of you who haven't seen the inside of one of those Clipper yachts, gee, they're sparse. They might be 72 foot long, but the galley is about what you'd expect in your average SNS 34. Uh, it is tiny, and uh, they they make do. They're functional rather than flash. We then moved on to 2011, where we were the principal host venue for the 2011 World Sailing Championships. Those championships, I don't know if you're aware, were organised by a private company, which was uh, uh, run by John Longley and Skip Lissman. And they pulled in the resources of all the clubs to uh, provide the in infrastructure needed to run that event. The legacy left behind by that event is almost um, it, it's difficult to value. Um, it left us with a pool of extraordinarily well-qualified volunteers, mark layers, race officers, uh, and, and the like. Uh, it left us with a poultice of uh, inflatable dinghies that we could use for coaching purposes which were then, after the event, allocated to various clubs. And this club was a recipient to a couple of those. There were compasses, there were rangefinders, there were flags, there were two-way radios, there were inflatable boys, you name it. We got a whole heap of stuff that was uh, left over after the event that was then distributed to the clubs for their use. So it was a, an extraordinarily uh, valuable event for the clubs that took part. And Fremantle Sailing Club was the key that held it all together because we had the, the space here and uh, the, uh, the, the volunteers. Am I running out of time? No, 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 I'm just sitting here. <laughs> You're not running out of time at all, it's fascinating. We also ran the 420 Worlds and the 505 Worlds recently and confirmed Fremantle Sailing Club's ability to professionally host large scale regattas. World Championship standard, and we have the sort of start boats we need, and we've improved them over the years to uh, to provide the infrastructure re required. That hasn't happened by accident, and I don't, you can't start this conversation without referring to Huck Scott. And I know Huck Scott originally came from uh, from uh, Royal Freshwater Bay Yacht Club, but he was just as much a part of Fremantle Sailing Club, and he 
set the foundation for our coaching programs in years to come. Uh, he had a favourite saying, which I'm sure you've heard before, which is worth repeating a thousand times over. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. And that was his mantra, and it is true today as it was back when, uh, when he was alive. Uh, Huck did national service in the Navy. He was also awarded some medals, and as you may or may not know, he won a silver medal at the Melbourne Olympics with Rolly Tasker in the lightweight Sharpie class in Falcon 4. He crewed for many years with Rolly uh, in his different versions of Falcon, and he was an integral part of this club's development for 40 odd years. He was just an amazing person. His legacy has been bestowed upon people like Belinda Stoll, um, a gold medalist performer in her own right, but a coach par excellence. She's the head coach for the WA Institute of Sport. She's produced countless champions. I guess it's not countless because I'm sure you could count them if you took the trouble. But she has produced an enormous number of champion yachts people from WA so that every time I go to the uh, sailing head office in Sydney, the head office is not a head office, um, they always acknowledge that WA, as far as championship sailing is concerned, punches way above its weight. They know the population figures and they know how many champions come out of here and they're gobsmacked. And that's due to the efforts of people like Belinda, her ability to use uh, supporting coaches to get her programs uh, implemented. And of course, I'd be very remiss not to mention Arthur Brett in the same sentence, because Arthur would arguably be the world's best single-handed coach. A lot of the success that's been enjoyed by our laser class in particular uh, can come back to the, the training methods of uh, Arthur Brett. And Arthur was allowed by the club very generously to uh, uh, abscond to the UK every so often to coach the UK Olympic laser team. So he has credentials that are recognised worldwide and he's again uh, just a super, super coach. And they've set the standard for our uh, dinghy sailing and long may that continue. Some of the champions they've produced and I, I'm really naughty for doing this because there are so many that once you start you can't stop. But the girls that won the 420 Worlds uh, backed that up a couple of months later with uh, a win in the 470s. They are Australia's representative in the 470 class for the Japan Olympics, if and when they ever happen. Uh, I could go on and mention people like uh, Luke and Tessa Parkinson for argument's sake. Tessa, another Olympic gold medalist, and Luke doing absolutely staggering things that uh, take him from uh, the foredeck on an uh, inter intercontinental ocean racer to still sailing competitively on centreboard dinghies. He's uh, an amazing yachts yachtsman and another product of the coaching methods that have come out of this club and the support that people get. Yeah, yeah. You can't talk about Fremantle Sailing Club without mentioning John Sanders. And once again, we're talking about somebody who's got multi-club allegiances John obviously came from Royal Perth Yacht Club, uh, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, his uh, sale number is still R4. Um, but John is also a very proud member of this club and uh, uh, greatly appreciated the preparation. He remains the only person to complete an unassisted, non-stop, triple circumnavigation of the world, and uh, he's currently locked down in isolation somewhere in the Mexican Gulf, I believe. Panama. Panama? Yeah. I think we're close enough. Uh, David Dix um, was on sea flight to, uh, with his mother Trish and, uh, and the family to farewell John on his current adventure. Um, David, you might remember, was supposed to be the youngest person to complete a single circumnavigation unassisted and would have done so but for one tiny little fitting failed and he had to have a replacement dropped off by helicopter and therefore it was considered it wasn't unassisted, therefore it couldn't stand.
Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Mm. Thanks, Ali. Okay, go on and on and on about the individuals which, who played such an important part in the club's development. But I really want to come to concentrate for a moment on the club's diversity because it's our diversity that makes us so unique. If, obviously, see the common, uh, the common place: the dinghies, inshore, offshore, cruising, power diving, angling, game fishing, pipes and drums. We've got a person section which look after all the gear. We've got duty officers who make our visitors welcome. We have a ladies' lunch group that, surprise, surprise, has been running for 40 years and meets once a month. We get a range of present company excluded, very talented guest speakers. Um, but many of these sections also run ancillary activities. Take the dive section, for instance. If you've seen their photographic exhibition, so they're not just divers, they do other stuff that people get involved in. The pipes and drums go and do wonderful things with their instruments and street parades and other uh, social events and so on. Uh, cruising, uh, cruising section organises these topic nights. So there are lots of other little things that our sections get involved in. Uh, Inshore does these jib and main things. And, uh, it's that diversity that makes this club so very special. I mean, we owe that to the way people have built this club up over the past 100 years. And that pretty much brings us to where, we, where it all started. These tiny little clinker built, mainly, uh, boats back 100 years or so ago, sailed off the beach with no harbour for safety. Um, to their current lightweight dinghies and the ability to get out on dinghies and have some fun to our national championships and not forgetting that we have a very professional staff at this club which run a, as many commercial events as is possible to gather. Sometimes we may consider that a bit of a temporary inconvenience when the car park is overflowing with guests who are not members because they're here for a function. But let me put that into perspective for you. It's those functions that allow us to keep the membership rates that you currently enjoy, allow us to keep the pen fees at the level that you currently enjoy. They bring in a level of profitability that uh, um, we couldn't do without them. So uh, our catering and food and beverage staff and our function staff actually do a wonderful job at keeping us where we need to be financially. And they've been doing it very tough through this sort of thing. But notwithstanding that, we've still got enough confidence in our club setup to say, look, we don't always need catered things and we can still have casual barbecues downstairs in the open. And that's one of the wonderful things. And we've finished a race uh, or beforehand uh, with, with uh, bacon and egg rolls, whatever. It's part of the atmosphere. So over the past 100 years, we've seen Fremantle Sailing Club develop into one of the finest yacht clubs in Australia, bar none. We have fantastic diversity for its members. We have wonderful facilities for not just our members, but also for the wider community. We're a greatly sought after venue for our overseas visitors, both cruising folk and people like the Clipper organisation who organise events that use the facilities. And we have a club that we can all feel very proud to have been a part of and I hope we can continue to enjoy it for the next 100 years. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to a close. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, it was factual, and uh, I, I, I rue the day that um, I went home to Dawn and said, guess what, honey, bunch, we've just uh, joined the Fremantle Sailing Club. And she said, where, why? I said, well, that was a tin shed across the road, Louisa Street. And of course, it led to a lack of a bit of paint and so forth, because uh, it was obviously we knew what was going to happen, or running it down. So uh, we went across and had our um, Sunday session there, and uh, Dawn said to me, thanks very much, but no thanks. <laughs> so, um, but Bernie, thank you very much for the memories. I, I had forgotten a lot of that. Um, I remember the 81 Bali getting the living bejesus bit out of us um, for four days. Um, I thought, you can stick this up your bum, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> but I uh, got to Bali and uh, it was a new experience. We'd never been there, like most of the crews, we'd never ever been to Bali. Um, singing our goon for the first time and uh, in the morning light and so forth, it was just sensational. So uh, the club, uh, the other little thing I would say is that I, I do recall, and something I'd forgotten until Bernie mentioned it then, um, the meeting we had in here when we had to decide what we're going to do as members to keep the club alive or sell it to Bondi. And we came in and not one of us knew really what was going to happen. It was a membership vote. So we walked in here and uh, I'd paid my thousand bucks. Remembering it was going to be, it was about 20, 20 bucks a year to be a member. So um, uh, I was a bit concerned that I'm, <laughs> to say the least, <laughs> that I might have been um, seen off. But anyway, the long and the short of it was, the, um, that's when the real um, Fremantle Sailing Club came to light. When um, I, I think to a person, we all just put our hands up and said, you know what, it is what it is, and we're going to put our two and six in. Some paid more. If you had pens, you had to pay a bit more. But the general membership decided that, no, nah, we're going to keep this, and that's what happened. So, Bernie, thank you for the memories, mm. and uh, I have a little gift for you. Not that I, I know you're not partial to a tipple. <laughs> I said, Bernie is a great um, custodian of uh, our history. Um, he's only a new chum, 1990, whatever it was, but we love him to bits. So anyway, thank you all for coming. Uh, a bit of a miserable night, I understand that, but you know, thank you. Our history is important, and um, I'd like to think we're going to keep it going for another 100 years. Thank you. Yeah.